title. <laughs> We're here to talk about changes at the state level that will hopefully help all of us do our work to make complete streets and nice communities and encourage sustainable transportation in the world. Uh, you can tell I'm stumbling over my word because I am not a public speaker. I'm a writer. I am Melanie Curry. I edit uh, Streets Blog California, your source for all news and information about sustainable transportation in California. Welcome. I'm glad you guys are all here. We have an absolutely stunning panel with us today with a lot of very intelligent, genius people who are now working at the state, helping us do our work. We have Darwin Musavi, who is working for the California State Transportation Agency, which oversees all of the transportation departments and agencies in California. He headed up, recently headed up the project that wrote the, I'm going to get this wrong, the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. Uh, I always say investments because I think that's how it should be, <laughs> which is which is a really major plan to, um, he'll talk about it. You can kind of guess from the title. Next to Darwin, we have Jeannie Ward-Waller, who used to be the policy director at Cal Bike. I have to throw that in. And now she is the deputy director of sustainability. Did I get that right now? <laughs> No, that's the next guy. <laughs> Jeannie, what are you? Deputy Director of Planning and Mod Modal Programs. And Modal Programs, which didn't used to exist at Caltrans, by the way. No. Jeannie is it. And so she's she's way up there in Caltrans doing our work for us. Next to her is Tony Dang, who used to head up California Walks and is now the Deputy Director of Sustainability at Caltrans. This is something to celebrate. Our people are in Caltrans, guys. <laughs> Next to him is Sergio Ruiz, who works for Caltrans District 4 in the Bay Area. He's been their um, bike and ped guy. That's as close as I'm going to be able to get to his title. But he's been doing it for years. He's been doing a really great job on putting together the district active transportation plan. And next to him is Ryan uh, And he works for the, um, well, one of the things he does is he works for the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. And he's going to talk about some of the local um, consequences and efforts to make what these guys are doing at the state level happen. And then we will have time for questions for everybody. And I'm getting away from this microphone. Darwin, take it away. All right. Thanks, Melanie, for that introduction. I'm going to try to kind of see my slides, but uh, um, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I turned my back to the rest of the panel. Um, but, uh, good to be here, everyone. I'm Darwin Musavi. I'm the Deputy for Environmental Policy at, at CalSTA, the State Transportation Agency. I'm going to give a quick overview of the plan that, that Melanie uh, mentioned, uh, but then you know, mainly excited to engage in, in conversation about what it means uh, for uh, uh, the uh, work that um, folks on the panel here are doing and, and all of you and, and by in general in California. So, next slide, please. So um, the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure um, was, was created particularly uh, to tackle um, our overall dependence on driving in the state of California. Um, and we know through our uh, efforts on climate uh, reduction that the transportation sector makes up over 50% of emissions in the state of California. Uh, we know that zero emission vehicles alone won't get us to our, our climate targets. So we have here at the state, we have pretty ambitious targets, uh, but uh, we will not be able to adopt zero emission vehicles fast enough uh, to really get to the necessary reductions um, to meet the, the uh, Air Resources Board's uh, targets for, for the transportation sector. And so it will really depend on both um, cleaning up the vehicles that we have, but also reducing our overall dependence on driving in the state uh, to meet those goals. And we also know that we need to reduce our dependence on driving because of numerous other co-benefits, as you all know, um, to, to um, uh, other modes of transportation, such as public health benefits, uh, particularly with active transportation. Next slide. 
So uh, in, in order to, to bring a lot of that work to reality as it relates to transportation infrastructure investments at the state, uh, we took on a, a two-year effort uh, that started in 2019 and came out of an executive order the governor passed to put together what we call CAPDI, which is our Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. And that was adopted last July um, and uh, has since been um, uh, s supported by the California Transportation Commission, and we're now working on, on the implementation of that plan. Next slide. It's for people online. Got it. Uh, is that better? Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So as I, as I mentioned, the, the plan was born out of an executive order in 1919. Uh, that executive order asked us to do the following listed here. Uh, basically asked us to leverage our state transportation spending to help meet our state climate goals. Um, and, and what that really looks like uh, in a nutshell is, is uh, increasing investments in, in walking, biking, and transit infrastructure uh, and moving away from auto, auto related and uh, uh, investments uh, and keeping in mind, you know, the executive order uh, made made clear that we should be thinking about lower income Californians in particular as we make these investments. Next slide, please. All right. Um, in terms of the, the scope of the, the um, executive order, it particularly covers um, a suite of what uh, adds up to be about $5 billion of, of discretionary annual investments. And these are the, the tr state transportation programs that make up um, uh, CAPTI. These are the programs that we're trying to influence. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks here are obviously um, very familiar with the active transportation program, but there are numerous other programs uh, at the state that, that may not be as aligned with some of those climate goals that we want to make sure we are we are spending in a way that, that gets us to, to our overall objectives. So that's why those are included. And what these programs all have in common is uh, state agencies have some sort of direct discretion in project selection or recommendation of what gets funded in these programs. So there are other programs out there um, that might be kind of formulaic programs that go straight to local governments, but but um, these are the ones where we have a, we have influence over the specific projects. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, CAPTI basically creates a, a holistic framework and approach um, for for those investments and and how we're how we're looking at at investing our funds. Um, it also comes with a, a suite of proposed changes in the form of specific actions to help align planning, programming, and mitigation activities with the framework. Um, and we're we're uh, doing all of this while while keeping in mind that the, the context and on the ground projects of of what this looks like in different communities can be very different you know rural california suburban communities urban communities um, uh, at a at a principal level we we think that all of our strategies apply but in terms of you know the actual context and and what the solutions look like on the ground it's going to look really different in different places next slide please so uh, the, the framework itself is made up of 10 principles, and I'll try to run through them fairly quickly here to give you a sense of, of, of what's kind of guiding our decision making. So if you go to the next slide, the first three here um, uh, are what I call the, um, the what, like what are we actually talking about investing in? So the first one is we want to build towards an integrated statewide rail and transit network and make that a priority for our investments. We want to invest in networks of safe and accessible bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure um, across the state. And then also, uh, you know, driving will continue to be um, um, a key part of travel in California. And so we need to make sure we're including investments in light, medium, and heavy-duty zero emission vehicle infrastructure as part of our broader transportation infrastructure investments to support um, uh, the adoption of zero emission vehicles. Uh, and then there are seven um, uh, principles in the framework that I think of as the how. So as we invest in those things, you know, how do we do so? What do we think about what should be at front of mind when we make those investments? Uh, the first one is, is to strengthen our commitment to social and racial equity by reducing public health um, and economic harms and maximizing community benefits.
benefits, you know, that's that uh, is really trying to both tie in um, uh, the need for for um, uh, thinking about who our direct investments are are benefiting, and then making sure that they're actual benefits for those communities, not just in those communities, but but um, um, tackling some of the 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 burdens of the past that our transportation system may have may have put onto those communities. Um, our approach on safety um, is also one that we're shifting. Uh, we need to make sure that when we think about safety, we're really we're really talking about um, uh, moving towards zero fatalities and and severe injuries, um, and not just thinking about collision reduction generally, but that it's really about about people's safety. Um, as we build our projects, we need to we need to ensure that we're um, assessing physical climate risk. You know, this is mainly about um, uh, obviously providing people with more options and and reducing greenhouse gases. But the reality is, climate change is here, and and we need to be building infrastructure that's resilient in the face of climate change. Uh, the next one, um, which is which is a big one for us, um, is promoting projects that do not increase passenger vehicle travel. So this is really about um, recognizing the concept of induced travel as a as a real phenomenon, um, and and essentially moving away from um, highway um, uh, and roadway expansion projects that have the ability to uh, induce additional driving. Um, we know that that we need to make that shift um, if we're going get serious about um, our climate agenda. Uh, thank you for the reminder. Uh, <laughs> promoting uh, compact infill development while protecting residents and, and, and businesses from displacement. Uh, you know, transportation, I think, can play a, a role in, in making sure that um, you know, we're investing in a way that supports a certain development pattern that we need to see here to, to make uh, biking and walking uh, more viable um, in the state. And then uh, actually, if we could click one more, I'm going to cover that middle one. I don't know why they came in reverse order, but um, um, uh, the reverse of that that infill one, we need to make sure that uh, we also recognize that our transportation projects have an impact um, on our natural and working lands, and that transportation investments can unlock land for development. So we need to be conscious of of um, the types of investments we're making and their impact um, on on those lands as well. And then finally, you know, this is this effort is is mainly about um, um, uh, uh, light duty vehicles and and people moving around the state. But uh, we play a huge role in um, the movement of goods as well. And so, developing a zero emission freight transportation system as part of our overall investments are are really critical. Um, so you know these this this overall frame is obviously broader than 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 biking, but it really tries to center active transportation um, and and an approach that's kind of community driven and put safety at the forefront as as how we think about our investments moving forward. So as I mentioned, we're working on, on implementation of the plan that looks like both using the framework as an overarching decision document for all the decisions we make at CalSTA related to investments, but also includes kind of specific actions, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, and efforts underway to, to change processes to, to be able to implement uh, these changes more easily across all of our work. Um, and in particular, includes a lot of updates to program guidelines for those very uh, programs that I, I mentioned earlier, and all of that is underway right now. And I'm happy in the in the Q and A discussion portion to to dive into this this more and what implementation really looks like. But uh, we are planning on putting out an annual report on implementation um, out this fall. It'll be our first report since it was adopted on on our progress, and and hope to do that annually as we as we um, uh, work to bring these concepts to fruition. And that's all I've got, and I'll pass on the mic so so Melanie can uh, stop policing me for <laughs> this thing that I'm doing. <laughs> but I appreciate you keep helping me keep keeping me accountable. <laughs> 
Thank you, Darwin. Hello, everyone. Really nice to see you. Uh, it feels like a little bit of a homecoming for me to be at the Cal Bike Summit since I used to have to be working while I was at this event. Um, but a uh, real pleasure to see lots of familiar faces and, and be part of this conversation. Um, I'm going to keep it short because I want to really engage in discussion with you. Um, as Melanie said, uh, Tony and I are key leadership at Caltrans, and um, Caltrans is uh, probably has one of the biggest roles in implementing the CAPDI plan that Darwin just talked about. Um, I think you all are pretty familiar with Caltrans and who we are, but we are the uh, state DOT, the State Department of Transportation. Um, we are massive, 22,000 employees, 12 districts. Um, I sit in headquarters, and uh, my role is to help set policy for how we are going to do this work, how we really are going to shift our investments. Um, and Tony and I are going to kind of tag team on this. He's going to talk about what we're doing on the complete street side. But importantly, what I want you to all to be aware of is we really are taking this mandate seriously. Um, we need to shift how we're investing in our state highway system. Caltrans owns and operates the state highway system. It is massive, 50,000 miles across the state. Um, and uh, what we are doing now that I think is really important for you all to be aware of is we are moving away from widening freeways as a serious strategy to invest in moving more people. So what that means instead is there are still massive needs on the system. There's congestion, there are buses delayed, there are obviously huge safety issues, huge barriers to people traveling um, by active transportation. So we need to um, focus on managing the system more effectively. So we are we are taking that mandate. It is spelled out pretty clearly in CAPTI. So if you do have a chance to read that document, I will refer you to page 18 where it talks specifically about this, <laughs> about how we need to shift away from widening our state highway system and focus on managing and moving more people and goods more efficiently on the system. So that means a whole range of things. Um, we really have to get much more creative than we've been in California in terms of how we do that. Um, it will require hard, things that are hard, politically hard, like pricing the system. Um, and we do need to have some serious conversations about that, but it also requires things like providing transit priority, looking for where, um, as I said, buses are delayed on our system. How do we get the buses, give the buses priority, move them out of traffic, and make them more attractive as an option so people don't have to drive? Um, so we're doing that work now. Um, we're working with a lot of agencies because, of course, we can't move unilaterally at Caltrans. We have to work with our regional partners, our local partners. We're all invested in a lot of projects, a lot of projects that are in the pipeline now that a lot of money has been been invested in, um, and there's commitments there. Um, but we are having some serious and hard conversations um, led in the districts with those partners about what can we do differently in those locations. Um, so that's a real-time conversation that's happening now. I encourage you to engage with your Caltrans districts on, hey, what are you doing on these projects um, that, I, that I know you're working on? How can we help? How can we do things differently? How can we make sure active travel is a priority? Um, so want you to be aware of that, and I will um, let Tony talk about what we're doing with our Complete Streets policy specifically. All right. Good morning, everybody. So uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about our new Complete Streets policy that was uh, released late last year. And so for those of you who are unaware, uh, the core of the policy really sets a, a direction for the department that says that um, all projects that the department funds or oversees will provide comfortable, convenient, and connected facilities for people walking, biking, and taking transit. So I just want to take a moment to underscore how what a shift this is for the department. It really flips the script uh, of, in terms of what has been expected uh, in the past uh, and really sets that default expectation for our uh, staff that all projects will be integrating these aspects. Now, I know we've gotten a lot of flack for, you know, y'all have had a policy before, what's different about it? But I, I just want to say that words matter and setting a vision and direction matter. It's about really creating that vision 
vision and, and creating that space for our staff to take the risks that we want them to, to take the informed risks that we want them to take to really implement this policy. I think uh, aside from that key operative piece of the policy, there's also a lot of uh, language in the policy that the department has never formally stated before. One piece I wanna highlight is that for the first time ever, the department is acknowledging that streets function as community spaces. That's never been said by our uh, department before, and I don't think any other state Department of Transportation has made that recognition in a formal policy before, right? So streets have many more functions than simply moving people, and there's uh, very much a, a role streets play in, uh, in creating uh, thriving and resilient communities. Uh, another, uh, some other language I wanna pull out from the policy for you all include, um, you know, uh, you know, we as a department have uh, released an equity statement really recognizing, uh, you know, the role that the transportation system has played in uh, creating and perpetuating uh, uh, systemic harms to uh, underserved communities. And within the, within the complete streets policy, we are acknowledging that and we've, we're directing our staff to really prioritize complete streets projects to, to really start the process of undoing that historic and current harm harm. Um, we have also acknowledged in the project that, you know, we are not perfect. None of us are perfect. And we recognize that some of our internal processes and procedures, you know, may uh, have in the past presented some challenges to our local agency partners, uh, to community organizations. And in the policy, we're committed to, you know, identifying what those barriers are and working with you all to, to, to get to a solution. Like, uh, you know, if, if if these processes are, are um, within our sphere of control to change or shift or adapt, we want to work with you all to do that because at the end of the day, we as a department do not want to be uh, the reason why uh, a project stops at, at our limits, right? And I know that that has historically been a very real challenge. Um, and I think on that point, uh, you know, the, in the policy, we're also, we've also acknowledged the importance uh, of connecting into the local and regional system, right? Um, you know, when it comes to walking, biking, and transit, it's all about ensuring that broader, complete, connected network. And so, uh, you know, we, we have directed our staff to, to really take a hard look at uh, how our projects integrate into the local and regional networks and, and vice versa. Um, I think, uh, you know, a policy is great. Uh, I, I know you all want action. I want action as well, uh, and so I just want to ensure you all that you know we are very much committed to taking action. And so, uh, as part of the rollout of the policy, we've identified uh, a handful of very high priority actions that we are committed to as a department. Uh, one of which is the development of uh, new contextual uh, design guidance. So, what does that mean? That's a bunch of words, right? So, it, it means uh, that you know we're going to work to define what that comfortable, convenient, and connected. Uh, facilities piece means, and we want to make sure that we define it in a way that uh, that that is sensitive to the local context, because we know that what is needed in a rural uh, downtown Main Street is going to be look look and require a very different approach than uh, in an urban downtown setting. Um, we've also uh, committed to, and uh, we actually have just rolled out uh, a new process for our highway maintenance projects. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, there's lots of different colors of money within the department. It's very confusing to everybody, myself included. Uh, and there's a lot of attention given to shop projects, but that's just one uh, pot of funding that we control. And shop projects have a very long project development life cycle. And so one of the biggest shifts with this new policy is we're requiring that our highway maintenance projects, which is a separate stream of funding that have a shorter project development life cycle where they are developed and delivered with in one fiscal year, uh, we're set. We have set out processes uh, for our staff to integrate complete streets into those projects um, as well. So you know we are pushing as much as we can with the levers uh, levers that we have uh, to, to integrate complete streets at every single opportunity. Uh, I think the, the last thing I'll say before I hand it over to Sergio is that um, you know for the first time ever within this policy, the department.
department is, uh, has committed to supporting transit. I, I want to emphasize how important that is because I think a lot of times in these conversations around complete streets, we are very much focused on, on walking and biking, absolutely important, but transit is also a, a, cre a key critical part of the complete streets conversation. It's a key and critical part of the conversation uh, around combating the climate crisis. And, you know, uh, we fully admit that we as a department have a long ways to go to really beefing up our expertise in, in terms of how we support and advance transit as a state department of transportation. But I think that this policy uh, really sets out a, a vision and a path for us to, to really take up that charge. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sergio, who uh, has been tasked with implementing this policy at the ground level. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I think we're going to go back to slide mode if that's okay. Um, and I might stand over. Yeah. With my excellent technical assistance, we got you covered. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this is much better. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, I'm Sergio Ruiz. I am the Complete Streets Coordinator for Caltrans District 4 in the Bay Area. So our jurisdiction is the nine Bay Area counties, um, similar jurisdiction as MTC. Um, so I'm not a deputy director, but um, I have been on the front lines for about close to 14 years at Caltrans working with communities and stakeholders and partners on trying to improve walking and biking in our region. Um, I've also been tasked recently with basically establishing our Complete Streets program at the district level and creating an office for Complete Streets. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, so I want to first mention, you know, at the district level, we, we do a lot of work as well. Um, not so much policy, because that definitely is more of a, a Sacramento thing, but, you know, we do play a key role in, in operating the state highway system. Um, one of the, the major tasks we did in, back in 2018 was develop our first district bike plan. And this was kind of a first for the state in having a district level plan that looked at uh, bicycle needs and prioritizing them so that when we have future investments, we know where we want to prioritize uh, bike improvements. And it sort of um, sparked or it informed uh, the development of district level active transportation plans for all of 12 districts eventually, including our pedestrian plan, which is more recent. Um, also at the district level, we have a strategic action plan, which is a little more internal facing in terms of like how we can improve our business processes. Um, there were a couple of key priorities that are related to complete streets that we identified. One is um, improving our ability to be better partners with our um, stakeholders and uh, and local agencies, um, and also basic and making sure that we're uh, engaging with uh, equity priority communities as we develop projects. Um, also in uh, building out a safe and complete transportation network at the district level. Um, so we see that also as a district priority, which is very much in line with some of the priorities that are laid out for the state. Uh, next slide. Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about like pre complete streets policy update because we have been doing a lot of work in the last few years in trying to maximize and leverage our investments um, mainly in the shop because that the shop is our one of our biggest programs that that Caltrans. You know what the shop is? Yeah. So, okay. The so it, it stands for the the State Highway Operation and Protection Program, and we uh, use it as a fix it first type program for maintaining and operating our state highways uh, throughout the state. So as you can imagine, it's it's a lot of resources and investment that happens at the state. Um, Two and a half billion a year? Yeah. Exactly. Just a drop in the bucket, yeah. <laughs> So to us, you know, that's one of the biggest opportunities in, in leveraging our investments to try to make it better for people walking and biking in our communities. Um, so one of the huge lifts that we did back in 2020, right, right before and during the, the pandemic, um, was infusing additional money into the shop to specifically augment our projects in the pipeline um, to improve walking and biking. And I wanted to just show off some of the, the great projects we were able to expand the scopes for for adding protected bike lanes, new crossings. Um, these are mostly all still in development. Um, I think one of the ones that will be developed soonest is on El Camino Rail in Mountain View. We'll be providing protected bike lanes and new crossings. Um, and then I would also say pre-policy update, one of the... Um, 
we basically we're looking for opportunities um, to to improve projects and incorporate scope for walking and biking. Um, but that was basically it. You know, if the, if the opportunity was there, we would take it. And sometimes it works. Sometimes um, we face challenges. And this new policy really does flip the script, as uh, Tony said. That um, by default we are now including these elements, and um, there'd have to be a really good reason to not include it. Um, next slide. So this is getting a little into the nitty gritty, but one of the key tools that we've developed to, to have that be the default is um, establishing a complete streets decision document for each of the projects that we develop. Um, and this is starting with a 2022 shop cycle. So these are projects that are just now getting programmed. Um, they're starting the development process. So they're still pretty early on. And a lot of these won't be constructed for another in another three or four years. Um, but because we've already started implementing this tool for this cycle, we actually have a good sense of how many bike lanes, how many crosswalks, uh, how many new sidewalks we're able to identify and incorporate into the scopes of these projects. Um, so this is just a list of the ones that we've reported so far for that cycle, which is, is pretty great. Um, there's just one example here in Colma on El Camino Real, um, which if you're not from the region, El Camino Real is uh, State Route 82. It goes through like a dozen different jurisdictions down the peninsula. Um, right now, there aren't really any segments with bike lanes on it. So there's a huge effort to try to get more continuous and protected bikeways throughout that corridor. Um, so next slide. Uh, another major change that's kind of in line with the new policy update is uh, developing performance measure targets for complete streets, uh, particularly in the shop. Um, and so we're not just looking at the pipeline projects or projects that are being programmed now, but we're looking 10 years out um, to projects that haven't been programmed yet and trying to identify how many bike improvements, how many uh, crosswalks and sidewalks uh, we can include and trying to get a sense of um, the need is and how we can meet those the targets that we set for ourselves and it's kind of a, a learning process in that we have interim targets now because it's the first time we've done this as a state um, and it's we're still kind of working in, in the mode where we're looking for those opportunities um, because we're looking at where the paving projects are and, and using those to prioritize where we invest in, in walking and biking where once we have performance targets set we might have the ability to go out and look at where the priorities are uh, and not just where the paving projects are so there could be potentially standalone projects uh, to include bikeways and sidewalks and crosswalks. Um, also at the district level, we're looking at Complete Streets performance, not only in our shop projects, but our bike plan, for example, it's been around for four years already. Um, and so we have four years of information of how we're doing in carrying out the, or implementing that plan and what programs are actually funding those improvements. Um, so the shop actually is funding about 42% of the improvements that are in development right now from the bike plan. The ATP, which um, if, you, if you were at the earlier panel on the ATP, you'll know it's very oversubscribed. It's actually only a smaller uh, fraction of improvements um, that were identified in the bike plan that are currently being developed. And then there are a whole host of other programs. Um, a lot of them are working with our partners with local and federal funding, funding sources to help carry that out. Um, next slide. Uh, also, with, um, with safety being one of the, uh, a key priority for Caltrans, we're also be, uh, doing a better job at leveraging our safety program to improve up bicycling in the region. Uh, so we have two key bicycle safety projects in our district. Um, both of them are on El Camino Real. Again, it's a it's a theme for today. Um, to to actually build out class four bikeways in two of the um, jurisdictions along that corridor. So I'm very excited about those. Uh, next slide. And then the ATP, going back to that, um, you know, as a region, you can question how well we've done com compared to other regions. Um, you can blame it on the fact that, you know, we have a lot of wealth in, in the Bay Area. Um, so sometimes it's harder to get all the points that we would need to get uh, those grants. But we do have a lot of great projects on the state highway system that were either mostly or in part funded by the ATP. So I wanted to just showcase um, some of the ones that we're working on, including uh, one that's actually sponsored by uh, District 4 in the city of Richmond. Uh, Central Avenue under crossing. Um, so that's the first time that we've actually gotten an ATP grant ourselves. Uh, and I'll thank Carl in part because it's part of the regional component that MTC helps uh, manage. Uh, next slide. 
Yes. I'm going to ask a question. Yes. What's that big U-shaped thing? That is a pedestrian bicycle overcrossing in East Palo Alto that was just constructed. So that also got ATP funds. Yeah. Uh, but actually, yeah, if you want to go back again, sorry. So that's top left is Richmond. It's a new undercrossing. Um, Central Avenue is the middle one uh, in the city of Alameda. Uh, we're doing a road diet uh, and uh, separated bikeways along parts of it. Uh, Bay Trail Gap Closure all along to a little drive in Oakland. Um, the U-shaped things in East Palo Alto. And then the Vine Trail in Napa is this long regional trail network that's spanning the entire county. Um, and a couple of the segments were funded through the ATP. Um, also exciting, and there's actually a panel this afternoon to talk about this, is our bike highway study. And this actually uh, came directly from our state bicycle and pedestrian plan. That was one of the strategies that was identified is, you know, what it would take to build out networks of bicycle highways. And these are for longer distance uh, connected facilities um, to really try to increase uh, bicycling as a mode and, and really shift the needle. Um, these are not defined at the state level. They're not found anywhere in our streets and highways code. Um, we have a very unique classification of bikeways, uh, class one bike paths, class two bike lanes, and so forth. So um, at the district level, at least, we're kind of evaluating what the best practices are and what it would look like to have bike highways in the California or Bay Area contexts. And also coming up with some concepts of what they would look like along different state highway corridors, uh, and then some implementation strategies and how we would work with our partners to try to carry that out. Um, so I, I definitely advise you to go to that panel if you if you want to hear more about bike highways. It's a very exciting hot topic. Um, and there's also um, sorry, go back. Again. There's a survey that just uh, went live. It's open through April 22nd. Um, hopefully the slides are available. But you can also just search for the study online, and there's a link to the survey there. If you, uh, we want to get your feedback on these concepts. Uh, next slide. Oh yes, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Um, and then just real quick, uh, I just wanted to highlight some actions that we're pursuing uh, kind of in the near term. Um, we're establishing a new Office of Transit and Active Transportation to try to do a better job of integrating transit um, and making sure that transit is part of what we do when we talk about complete streets. Um, we also want to update the bike plan, uh, realizing it's four years old. So by next year, it'll have been five years, and we want to um, do an update of that and work closely with our headquarters counterparts to make sure that it's in line with all the um, the, the, the district level active transportation plans and, and the data that's being developed statewide. Um, and then we want to do our very first district for transit plan, um, which is also, I think, a first for the state, where we want to look for opportunities to invest in transit supportive infrastructure on the state highway system. Um, so that's in a nutshell. Um, and there's my contact info. Um, so I'll go ahead and pass it along to Ryan, who's going to talk at the local level uh, and efficacy. Ryan, do you have slides? Um, no, no slides. Well, there you go. I'm not winging it, I hope. So, um, <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Modishemi. I am a volunteer with, and I'm here in my capacity as a volunteer with the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. Um, specifically, I volunteer with the San Mateo local team. So for those who aren't from around here, San Mateo is a, a suburban city of around 100,000 folks on the peninsula in the Bay Area. Um, it's one of the communities along El Camino Real that Sergio was, was talking about, so that's definitely a highway of a lot of importance. Um, and I just wanted to start out by saying that this is truly refreshing to hear as an advocate who has been working on trying to get Caltrans and other jurisdictions to um, plan for bicycle facilities, pedestrian facilities, and transit priorities. So it's like a paradigm shift in how the state is planning. And regardless of what criticisms I may have of Caltrans, I think that, that this is a yeah, it's, it's a truly, I, I would say, revolutionary change that I hope certainly um, accelerates in the future. So honestly, give it a round of applause for all these people Yay. who are here.
having allies within the department who are interested in these changes is um, definitely going to be helpful going forward. And I've already seen us having the ability to be able to um, be more communicative and get more information from folks like Sergio, who is the District 4 um, Bike Ped Coordinator. I don't know if I'm botching your title, but yeah. Um, and, um, and we are looking forward to working with him and other folks on um, planning for complete streets improvements on El Camino Real, which is um, the main non-freeway north-south corridor on the peninsula. It stretches from the southern end of San Francisco through San Mateo County and into to Santa Clara County and provides one of the best opportunities for having connected um, uh, bike, bikeways throughout the three counties and also transit priority on the highest ridership bus line um, for, the, for the local agencies, uh, Sam Trans, as well as high ridership lines in Santa Clara County. Um, so I'm excited about the complete streets policy and um, we'll use a shop project actually, um, Sergio mentioned the shop program uh, to kind of of highlight how some challenges I had and uh, groups that I work with had um, working on advocacy for that project and how I think the Complete Streets program is refreshing and would help overcome some of those challenges for future projects. So in Burlingame, which is a city next to San Mateo that um, uh, it also lies along El Camino Real, um, there is uh, the, the highway itself is um, very, uh, it, it's a, a smaller right of way for this highway. The highway width is mostly normally 100 feet wide, um, but here it's around 44 feet wide. And it has these large eucalyptus trees on either side of it that um, are treasured by some folks in the community who tend to have um, more political power or the, the ears of um, more of the council members. So there's this, already there's this balance, imbalance in terms of political power between folks who are interested in preserving the status quo of the highway and folks who want improvements, at the very least pavement improvements or sidewalk improvements, um, which couldn't really be done without um, uh, impacting potentially these uh, tall trees. Um, so Caltrans it was, is now going through this shop project to repave the roadway, which hasn't been repaved, I believe, in decades. Um, and also do ADA improvements that are required by law. And the key word here is required by law because oftentimes um, if it's not required by law, it's not gonna happen. And in the case of the complete streets policy, finally these improvements are being required by policy and are gonna happen hopefully at some point. Um, but the groups that I was a part of um, were unhappy that there was no um, planning in any of the environmental um, processes for this project because it has to go through its environmental review. The, the EIR has to happen um, in order for the project to be certified and then later go into final design and construction. Um, and what happened was that we were seeing language in the EIR and the project team saying that, you know, because the local government of Burlingame hasn't identified bicycle facilities or transit facilities facilities on this highway as a priority or as any any designated facility, we're not, um, we haven't studied or we are not recommending as an alternative bicycle facilities on this highway. And keep in mind, this is the main highway with many destinations right next to it with cyclists who use it and who would use it if it was actually safe to bike on the roadway. Um, and also, it, again, it, it's the highest transit ridership line in, um, in throughout the county. So, so there's this dissonance between like, oh, the local government hasn't planned for it. Um, and, and there was no pushback from another source due to lack of political power or lack of initiative at the Caltrans level to actually make the change. So there was this headwind that we were going against in advocacy. Um, there were some specific rationalizations uh, made looking into the project, for example, that, that I hope are also 
changed, for example, like apparently buses cannot stop in a travel lane because, or like it's not ideal according to some traffic engineers because that would require cars to stop behind it. So instead they would need to do a pullout for buses, which would make the project more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas if the buses did actually get to stop in the lane of travel, um, that would actually be better for safety, for pedestrian safety because, um, um, because of the um, lack of cars um, being able to swing around in general and also because of the and then also the travel time for buses because they don't have to pull back into um, into traffic and wait for the cars so so we saw that kind of language because there was a road diet alternative that said let's let's do a road diet but one of the reasons for not going forward with that road diet alternative which didn't have bike lanes in it actually the, the alternative was um, um, uh, ultimately not marked as the preferred alternative because um, one of the reasons was um, that buses would need to have a pullout and that was an assumption that was made as opposed to just letting the bus stop in the lane of traffic. Um, some other language that we saw that I think um, hopefully is changing as a result of this complete streets policy is um, that the assumption is made that if you have a parallel route that is planned for bike lanes, that that's enough. And it's categorically not enough. Just having a bike lane 500 feet away on a different road does nothing to improve the safety of the road that you're studying. So it's not a complete street. And um, I'm glad that that's kind of changing or hopefully it's changing as part of this policy where we make, we design every street to be a complete street and don't just tell people to use other streets that don't have the destinations that the state highways necessarily do. Um, so it's, it's for primary north-south corridors, it is important. Um, so I, so I, guess, I guess in conclusion, I would say that I hope that these contextual design guidelines that are being developed um, and the, this leadership from Caltrans extends to, um, to pushing back on local processes that don't necessarily take into account complete street plans whether they were you know, developed before this idea of complete streets was super mainstream or whether because there isn't political will to do what um, is now being considered a basic safety and design standard. So um, I hope that that happens. And I guess in an ideal world, would certainly hope that this policy would be retroactively um, applied to projects that have gone through um, most of their environmental stages because in reality, this plan is looking for future investments, but there are a lot of projects in the shop that, and in other programs that will be going through their final environmental approvals in the next few years and will be constructed and implemented in the mid 2020s and so on that will not be complete streets facilities because they missed the boat and they, they had this environmental approval process mostly done prior to the policy being implemented. So I think it's worth the conversation about what are the trade-offs of looking at whether or not we can retroactively implement this policy to these projects, because there are trade-offs. It could mean extending project timelines and preventing us from working on newer projects. It, it could mean um, just delays in the overall primary goal of moving the statewide investment in a more positive direction. But at the same time, in places like Burlingame, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to make this difference. And um, I, I do sometimes get worried about what would happen um, if uh, you know bike lanes are not planned for on a facility like this or transit um, lanes or transit priority are not planned for on a facility like this at this time. Um, but that being said, I think that what this has opened up and this experience has opened up for me and others is to have that further communication with, with folks like Sergio in the department and um, to, to understand and plan ahead for other projects like South San Francisco, Colma, and um, Mountain View and other places um, that Caltrans is planning to be proactive and you know get active transportation and transit improvements baked in earlier on. So I am really excited about the direction that everything is going in 
and um, we'll always be pushing you know, the state to do more. So, thank you. Thank you all. This is like really fascinating and I'm sure that there's a lot of questions out there, but I'm going to start. I have the mic. I get the first question. <laughs> um, so we all know that we're in a hurry. We don't have time to fool around the IPCC report, all the other reports that are along the LAO just came out, the legislative analyst office just came out with a California specific report. We know this, we gotta get this done now. And I've heard, I hear a lot of the metaphor about how hard it is to, uh, what is it, to shift the direction of a ship. Thank you, I guess. Um, and yes, it does take time, but I, I guess general question, how are we going to make this really great planning effort that's happening at the top translate all the way onto the ground? And that means going through that whole hard middle of engineers, not just at Caltrans, but at cities everywhere who the decision-making process and are trained to think about only car and car throughput and it's impossible for them to think any other way they need their minds changed but that's like we can't we don't have time to change their mind so anything you guys can say about how are we going to make that really difficult shift ASAP so the work that you guys are doing helps us tomorrow or next week, or okay, next month. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Jeannie take the brunt of it, but I'm gonna start us off. But but, but yeah, no problem. I got you. Uh, I just you know in terms of your your uh, the saying about turning the ship. You know I think what's what's important to 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 think about is we use, we even internally used to use that a lot, particularly when a lot of these efforts were ground up and a few people trying to literally you know um, use a little tugboat to, to pull a giant giant ship. But I think what's what's you know important about the policies to Tony's point is that you know now you've got the captain of the ship and people actually steering the ship moving in a different direction, and it's about making sure everyone else knows where we're going, which I think yes is incredibly challenging, but a lot easier than the reverse. Um, um, and so I think the, the leadership is 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 you know really meaningful. Yes, it takes time. There's a lot of education and work to do. And the reason I said Jeannie and Tony can take the brunt because I, I think a lot of it will come down to, you know, the Caltrans initiatives underway of making sure we're, we're, we're educating people, changing specific guidance and whatnot, not just high level policy, getting into the weeds um, on, on implementation, making sure there are champions in, in various places in the organization that are gonna, that are gonna push um, um, the, the policy out, folks like Sergio. Um, uh, you know, I think that's what it comes down to. I'll let you expand more, but I, I, I think it's, you know, the, the uh, since CAPDI um, uh, has come out, it's been what less than a year. I think we've seen already a pretty big shift in terms of responses of, of, of policies and whatnot um, that are, you know, I think uh, has have moved a lot faster than anything that came, you know, uh, uh, prior to that over the last five or six years. So I think it is it has sped us up a ton, um, but. Let you expand. <laughs> well, I, I would say, I mean, having two policy directors that worked in advocacy be promoted to deputy directors within Caltrans is like a pretty good sign that things at Caltrans are changing. And I, you're right, Melanie, I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. We have a, a workforce of 22,000 people. So changing a culture with that many people, like, you know, even if we're saying all the right things at the executive level and every district director is saying the right things and many of them most of them, I would say, are. They are there. They're right with us. They're supportive. They're pushing this. Um, you still have to make sure that message gets to all 22,000 and everybody's ready to embrace it. I will say, and I want to recognize, please turn around. My colleagues in the back row here, raise your hands, wave. These are Caltrans staff. 
awesome. They are doing the they are doing the hard work, um, and um, I'm truly inspired because they are super motivated. They are changing. Sergio has been huge leader here in the Bay Area. Um, there is a lot of change happening, but it's gonna. It, we've got to all move together, and the local governments have to come with us. We can push. We can lead more than we ever have, and I think we're poised to do that. Um, but we're not gonna do it perfect in one sweep. I mean, I think the El Camino Real is a good example of that. You know, we get better each time. We learn from that. Please celebrate when we do good things. We'd love hearing that because we're used to being a big punching bag. So when we actually hear like, hey, Caltrans did something good, it feels really good and very empowering for the staff. So please appreciate that, but engage. I mean, I'm, I have an open door. I would love to hear from you all, from, from advocates out there. It really helps us to hear at the state level when and why this change needs to happen. And we got to all be pushing in the same direction. So I totally agree with you, Melanie. And I, whoever writes those streets blog daily updates, like the IPCC report is at the top of everyone every day. So I you know, noticed. I appreciate, <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, it's, there's not an easy answer to that, right? We're, we're a big state. We're very diverse. Most trips are still driving trips. So a lot of people are still very wedded to their car and how they get around. And we've got to change that together. But I think we're, we're I mean, Darwin said it well. We've got, there are a lot of signs that we are right at that opportunity. That all the pieces are in place to make some really big change. So let's do it together. Yes. Yeah, and I will say it's not just a communications and, and, and messaging challenge to our staff, right? And, and one thing I'll, I'll pull out of the policy is that, uh, you know, in the past, uh, these these decisions are, were made at the project level, as you kind of alluded to, with the project engineer and with the policy, we've, we've shifted that and elevated that decision making to an executive level. So that the district directors are the ones who are making that call uh, for a project that may not be able to uh, integrate complete streets facilities as we've expected. And as Jeannie alluded to, our executive team is right there with us. And so this is really about kind of uh, ensuring that that policy check occurs with the projects uh, to get at the outcomes that we're expecting. Cool, Sergi, did you have something to say? Grab the mic. It feels like that question was directed to me because a lot of the issue is at the district level. Um, I can safely say that our district executive leadership is fully on board with the new direction. Um, they're always um, saying, you know, it's not just about automobile delay anymore. We really have to prioritize other modes. Um, there's still like the middle man management and other staff that I think, you know, us as a district, we have to do a better job of training. Uh, I want to make a lot of our complete streets and um, strategic planning training mandatory for a lot of these staff, but you know, that's something we have to work on internally. Um, yes, a state law. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Require uh, this. So, I mean, we, we're do, we are taking some actions at the district level that, that, that I'm hoping helps um, prevent issues like saying that in-lane in traffic stops are, are just a no-go and just not assuming that anymore and kind of move beyond that. But yeah, we still have a, a ways to go for that. Are, are we also hoping for retirements? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone who has retired is retired. <laughs> I would never say that. <laughs> okay, I know that there's a lot of questions. I also have one um, online question. Maybe I'll read that first and then we'll move on to all of you enthusiastic people. I should have read this before. Okay, this is Chico. On a local level, Chico Velo has been working to give feedback on projects with Caltrans. However, we are having some difficulties with some upcoming projects where they have rejected integrating these policies despite these new goals. I've got some specifics on a project in Chico coming up where the plan selected does not include bike facilities, despite one of the alternatives having included them. I mean, this is a very common problem that people are having right now. We know about these policies, but getting people to say, oh yeah, you're right. The Caltrans leadership is telling us to do that. It's kind of hard to get across. So the question is, how can we get better support to advocate for these alternatives that include bike facilities? I think Jeannie might have partially answered that by saying her door is open. Call Jeannie. <laughs> 
going to call the, the deputy director for sustainability at Caltrans and they're going to tell you. Do you guys have anything to add to that? To that point, I, I mean, elevating the issue is, is, I think, you know, you don't have to start with Jeannie necessarily, but, <laughs> but, but you can work your way up there if you need to. Um, and, you know, the, that's, the policies are, are, are just as good as the accountability. You all are part of that accountability. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, making sure that the staff is aware of the policies and then that you're elevating, I know, shouldn't be on all of you. And, and we're working to make that not the case, but, but you know, it, it's it certainly helps uh, if you all play a role in that. And I would just say, I, I think that really highlights the important role of advocates who are on, on the outside officially yelling that something needs to be done. And sometimes people who are in a position to make a decision need those advocates. They might totally agree with what you're saying and not have the power or not feel like they have the power to do it. But if you are on the outside pushing, it helps them get step over that edge. So the advocacy role is super well, important. And can I just say, I mean, having been an advocate and knowing many of you in the room, I'm surprised that I don't hear from advocates more often. You know me. You know what I care about. Call me. Seriously, I'm not kidding. I mean, I may get 100 emails tomorrow, and that's okay. <laughs> but, uh, but honestly, like, we need that support. And, and, you know, don't doubt that we're not hearing from the constituents that want their roads widened. Yeah. So we need to also hear from the constituents that don't want the road widened and want the bike lane instead. So so it really is important. I can't stress that enough. Um, I was a really annoying advocate and Caltrans eventually was like, why don't you just come work here so you can stop bugging us. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's not helpful. everybody should be getting a job at Caltrans. Some of us need to be on the outside. Come work at Caltrans, <laughs> that works too. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start with Jason over here. I saw some, I'm going with his hand first. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, and uh, uh, inspiring new uh, information about uh, the urgency that, you, that Caltrans is finally uh, taking uh, with climate change. Um, so I have two questions, and, and I'm just on the fly, I'm gonna decide which one to ask. Um, so about a year ago, Buttigieg and, and Biden started talking about the reparations, including removing uh, urban freeways. Um, but I didn't hear you talk about that. Um, and I was uh, involved in, in post freeway removal in Hayes Valley. Um, and you know, part of the, the planning around that was that you know, by now, the remainder of the, the vestigial central freeway Freeway would have been also removed because it is a traffic disaster. It's just a long off ramp into the middle of San Francisco. Um, so, what are your thoughts on, uh, or what is the thinking right now at Caltrans about some of these erroneous freeway projects? And uh, are we going to have a glimmer of hope of in Oakland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles of having some of the, some of these things removed? Well, I'm an, since I have the mic, I'm going to start. <laughs> um, I, I just want to stress, along with just the urgency that you're hearing from us and the fact that you all know the climate crisis is really important, the federal infrastructure money is going to flood the state in the next five years. So we have got to make sure that is spent in a way that's truly transformative. We could spend it all on pavement, just repaving the roads, and you wouldn't see a transformative benefit. I don't think that's what we want. So we need to really have a conversation about how should those that money be spent in a way that is transformative, in a way that really shows people um, that their transportation system can look totally different. And I think that the opportunity with reconnecting communities and really investing there is key. Uh, I'm gonna let these two expand on your specific question, but I wanted to just hone in on like that federal money that's massive, it's gonna flood the state and we gotta make sure we spend it in a way that's gonna move the needle. Great setup for, for what I'm about to get into. Um, and I'll talk about the money generally, and then Tony can dig into, into what Caltrans is doing about it. But um, you know, to that point, you know, there is a, a billion dollars out of the federal program for or, uh, IIJ for the Reconnecting Communities Program. The governor's budget uh, here in California, uh, uh, Newsom's budget proposes an additional 150 million to create a, a highways to boulevards Reconnecting Communities Program here in the state to help leverage those federal funds. Uh, 
funds. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly moving on those ideas. There's money being proposed uh, to get projects um, uh, in line and, and out the door. There's, there's current bill language out there and what that program would look like. If you're interested in some of the details, it's really about making sure that we're, um, uh, we're building on, on some of the successes we've seen elsewhere. We've really looked at a program like the Transformative Climate Communities Program at the Strategic Growth Council. Um, if folks are familiar with, with that one in terms of, of um, um, having these projects be um, as community driven as possible. Um, you know, this can't be, we can't um, uh, uh, go in and say we're looking to repair harms of the past and do it top down. That would be completely different, uh, defeat the, the purpose. Um, and I'll let Tony kind of expand on, on what Caltrans is planning specifically. Yeah, uh, I, I think I'll start by saying that this reconnecting communities program uh, that the state is proposing it, it has come from cat's eyes. So here's an example of how a, a high level policy document, how we're working to translate it into a funding stream and then translate it into a program to actually make change. So with that $150 million, we are uh, intending to, to set up a, a brand new program uh, that would fund both um, the community-based planning that, that they is really needed for these types of projects, as well as uh, capital uh, projects that either convert or cap uh, a highway, and really to uh, kind of unlock the, the potential of that land, whether it's for uh, affordable housing, whether it's for uh, green space, open space, park space. And so a uh, high level, uh, you know, we're intending to uh, fund the planning efforts as well as the implementation efforts. And I think recognizing the urgency of the climate crisis in the proposed uh, bill language, we've also um, uh, have some ideas around funding early implementation action planning and then implementing things in the near term. I think that, you know, both at the state and federal levels, it is very challenging for a variety of reasons uh, to uh, remove cap or, or otherwise kind of uh, approach these types of projects. But we want to see action as soon as possible through these types of programs. Programs, and we're proactively uh, thinking about that and taking that approach. And one more thing. Hold on, I want you to use the mic because people online can't hear you. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Adrian St. John. I'm in the headquarters Complete Streets office in Caltrans. Um, and I just wanted to let you know about one tangible local thing here in Oakland. There's an RFP out from Caltrans Division Transportation Planning right now this month for consultants to help develop the Vision 980 for removing 980 here through Oakland. So I wanted to let you guys know specifically about that one. One, one thing that didn't come up that I wanted to add is as part of the, the, the state proposal for the state program, a key component is making sure anti-displacement strategies are integral to the program. I think that's gonna be you know, incredibly um, important to the success of the program to make sure we're actually serving the communities that we're intending to serve. Quick add on. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention the 980 RP as well. So that's great um, because we want to be at the table. Um, we know that a lot of these efforts tend to be community driven, but we want to make sure that we can actually be part of the conversation and it's aligning with our state priorities. Uh, but also, just uh, um, in reference to the equity statement and acknowledging that past invest investments have harmed a lot of communities, that alone has given us the, the ability to justify adding a freeway ramp improvements in our projects where before we would say, oh, that's a local issue that the locals have to deal with our freeway crossings, not Caltrans. Uh, it's really flipped the conversation in that we need to address these past harms and we have to help uh, be part of that solution in reconnecting the communities. Use the microphone, use the mic, Tony. I really gotta emphasize though, our equity statement is not just about recognizing past harms, it's about recognizing past, current, and stopping future harm. That is our equity statement and that is our commitment. Please. <laughs> yeah. 
just just about. Uh, yeah, just really, really quickly. I think like um, the freeway removal concept is is very intriguing for sure, and also in other on other corridors where perhaps there is not a freeway removal potential in the works, but there are still significant harms and impacts that are happening to equity priority communities up and down those corridors. For example, Highway 101 near near where I live. Um, though there are projects in the works, both good and bad for, for, for those areas. For example, trying to remove off ramps that funnel high speed traffic into communities are good projects. Um, but then highway widenings, bad projects. So there's the, the hope that that investment also channels into influencing how those projects that are currently in the environmental process develop, hopefully fast tracking, um, fast tracking projects that help improve local street road safety and um, uh, changing projects that propose to widen highways. Okay, cool. We have another question from the back. Okay, great. So I was thinking that when you're talking about diversity and getting the engineers to um, take, like learn, why not simply say that it's mandated because it's about diversity? I mean, we're talking about mobility justice in the same way that probably people are mandated to go to uh, diversity training about gender or, or other intersectionalities. Maybe that could give you the mandate to do it. The second thing, I was noting that you uh, need to do a lot more studies but why not look internationally? I mean, Copenhagen Eyes has basically solved the problems of streets on an international level when we're talking about Global North streets and superhighways are implemented in many countries already. It's not like a new thing. It doesn't seem to me that we need that many more studies. And that now the third thing, and then I'll be finished, is zero emission vehicles. That language should be changed. If anything, it's um, displaced emissions vehicles. And I think that Jason's uh, presentation f uh, robustly showed us how we, okay, we were saving maybe the asthma for the kid who lives in, in downtown Oakland, and that's fabulous, but there are people in the rare mining and so forth that are dying, and it, the zero emission, a low emission vehicle is a bicycle and is foot traffic, and it's super dangerous because the electric car is what the industry wants and what the rich people want, and that's exactly going to create it's, there's no solution. It, we're going to have to stick with highways if we go in that direction and people just drive more and more with their electric cars. So I just language is so important. So I'm going to quickly address one of them because I think there were three questions in there. But um, uh, come to the bike highway uh, panel at 2.30 because we we're going to talk about how we looked at international best practices. Um, I know, you know in California we have our own, our own highway design manual and statutes that we follow, but um, we can learn a lot from other countries and not just in Europe, but in South America and, and elsewhere. Um, but, yeah. I, I mean, I... I totally hear you and I, all of those are great comments. I think the challenge for us and, and part of the reason why we do studies is not just to like, let's do a theoretical study, but you actually do have to do a lot of community engagement. And I think that's another thing that you are hopefully seeing, will hopefully see more from Caltrans. You know, we have a history of just coming through and bulldozing communities and putting our transportation infrastructure through. We cannot do that anymore. We are, we are not in that era anymore. We have to engage um, and we have to have community-driven solutions. So that's part of the reason for the studies. It's not an excuse. I think it actually is a critically important piece of making sure that we get projects right or at least do them significantly better in the future is making sure that we really are creating that space um, and, and reaching out and actively involving the community, especially communities that have been historically harmed by our system. So you can't just look to Europe and say, let's just do what they did in Copenhagen. You have to go out and work with the community and be really committed to that. So, so that's part of you know, why we do those and why it takes a long time, but, but su support a lot of what you said. And, and uh, you know, we're, it's a big state. There's a lot of opinions in this state. We're, uh, we're the government. So we have to try to, you know, bring everybody along with us um, in terms of where we're going. And we are still in a reality where most people drive. So, um, you know, making those cars at least not have emissions coming out of the tailpipe, <laughs> even though you're right, there are still emissions, um, is a vast improvement from what we have 
today, but it's not, um, you know, hopefully giving them better alternatives for how they get around so they don't have to get in that electric car um, is even better in the future. Hi, um, my name is Janita Chu. I'm from United Seniors of Oakland, Alameda County. And I just want to say, Tony, I'm very proud of you. I, I don't know if you remember 10, 12 years ago when we started this movement up on the second floor here. And um, I mean, look how it's grown. It was just like 90 of us up there all scrunched in. So I'm proud of you, dude. <laughs> Hi, my name is Arnold Schur, um, and it's great to hear about the vision and the new policies that you all have. And you mentioned accountability. What are some of the ways that you've built into your own processes to hold you and your staff accountable towards these new visions and goals, and specifically looking towards equity as well? Um, yeah, I can, I can uh, start us off. There's a lot we could go through, but at a high level, since we did go over go over CAPTI, I mean, the, the annual report in particular for that is meant as a key accountability metric where we're going to have to report to, to the public and to our stakeholders, you know, on all the specific actions, where we are, what's our status. Um, we're going to have data in there about, about what the total suite of projects are looking like, how they're shifting over time. Um, um, and, you know, I think that is... Uh, Yes, it's for a public audience, but is a key internal accountability metric as we put that together to, to make sure that we're we're at a high level kind of working towards those goals. There's a ton more, obviously, you know, in terms of all the specifics under that. I don't know if anyone wants to. I mean, I think in the specific complete streets context, uh, another uh, change we've made with, with um, the complete streets decision document that we've built into um, the process that we've set up for highway maintenance projects is we're having those decisions come to headquarters. And, you know, we want to take a hard look at, to see whether our processes are working. Uh, we acknowledge that these are new processes that we're, we set out that are going to require training and time with our staff. And we want to give our, ch we, we're creating those openings and opportunities for our staff uh, to, to really implement the vision of the policy. And then at headquarters, I think we want to take a look and evaluate, is this working? And if not, pivot and change, because I, I think that that's really, really critical. So, um, you know, that is something that we are absolutely committed to do at the headquarters level. Yeah, so I'm, I work in academia, and I, I'm curious about the role of universities and colleges in, in, in educating uh, new hires. So um, what, what is your experience? Are, are graduates, uh, new hires nowadays, uh, differently educated, uh, or do you still have a lot of wishes that you would want to broadcast to colleges and universities? And like in what areas of culture? trans operation are you looking for changes in how uh, the university system in california trains new engineers new managers and and uh, so that's kind of my 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 impression to you guys well, I would say from where I sit, yes, we are seeing a big change with new new folks that are coming out of universities and wanting to work at Caltrans. It's, it's really exciting. It's very inspiring. There's a lot of energy for folks coming in at the entry level that are thinking about things differently, looking at these issues really differently. And I think, you know, coming in with values like, you know, wanting to understand community needs, thinking about equity, you know, really having the consciousness of kind of the, I think the whole country right now and thinking about things like social justice, um, climate change, and, and wanting to work on those things. So that is hugely exciting for me. It's very inspiring as a leader in Caltrans to, to really support and empower folks who want to grow and want to work in government. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I trained as an engineer 20 years ago, um, and I found my undergraduate engineering education really lacking in those issues. You know, it was all technical. It was all about just like, how do you build projects? It was not about what are the implications of those projects, especially in the era of climate change. Um, so I pursued, you know, additional education, additional 
institutional training, thinking about sustainable development and, and what is that bigger charge? And I think that's led me to where I am now, um, where I'm much more kind of on the planning side of Caltrans, thinking about the bigger the sort of systems issues, community issues. Um, I, I think all engineers should get that as part of their education. That should be part of, of the basic curriculum. Um, and, and I think it is, you know, we see it more, but um, it could be a lot stronger because um, we need folks who aren't just technically trained. We call, there's like a, a new type of uh, staff at Caltrans that we call a plan engineer, like somebody who understands planning and un understands the technical engineering side. And, you know, that should be a degree. <laughs> like we should have these dual degree programs or, you know, create a new degree that uh, that students can can get both of the, the issues. Um, so that's my opinion, but anybody else want to speak? Okay. I know there are more questions. We'll start over here. Hi, thanks for the panel. Hopefully this is a softball uh, question, but I, I am one of those students who's a, a planner in training up at UC Berkeley, and I, I am really interested in getting involved in state government. So what would you say is a good, uh, what should be my next steps in terms of like looking for internships or, or getting involved and getting that experience that I think is really needed? I'll give you my email. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and <Tony's. laughs> I said, I'll give you my email. <laughs> but, but to build on that, I would say, you know, uh, yes, again, you know, everyone in this room is going to email Jeannie after this session, but, <laughs> but, but in addition, in addition to that, I think, you know, uh, try to figure out what you're, what in particular you're interested in. And if you can't tell, which I wouldn't be surprised because our organizations are large and obscure, um, you know, find, find, um, some work that you think sounds interesting to you, figure out who did it, contact them, um, and then start learning about the organization. I think getting actual contacts, you know, in organizations, will help you know you figure out where your openings are um, because you know it, it's different depending on what you want to do and sometimes it may be an internship sometimes it may be a job opening that someone can lead you to but um, uh, you know talking to the folks that you want to end up uh, doing the job of is always I think really helpful <laughs> Well, I mean, I'll expand too. We are going to be doing a lot of hiring. So this is a really good time to be coming in to government, uh, especially with the federal infrastructure dollars. I mean, we've, we're going to have a lot of projects to deliver, a lot of work to do, a lot of plans to do. So um, so this is a great time to be interested. And the process can be daunting. The civil service process is like, there's like this exam and what's that about? And, you know, it's, it's not as bad, like once you get into it, but talking to, you know, any of us that, that are at Caltrans can, you know, we can give you tips and, that's the best way to really learn and understand the process. So it, it's kind of a joke. You, I'll give you my email, but but seriously, like just having a quick 10 minute conversation will probably be more helpful to you than like going on the website and trying to navigate the process. So, yeah. I, and I just have to make a comment about that because when I was in grad school, one of my professors said very firmly, whatever you do, do not get a job at Caltrans. <laughs> Well, suck your soul. And you know what? I think she was right, but now it's changed. And if, if people who are in grad school now are going to be working, no, she doesn't. She doesn't, right? You know who it is. <laughs> she does not say that because a lot of her students are now working at Caltrans and making a difference. So it is a, that's so great that people in grad school are going to be moving in that direction because that's going to save us. Okay, more questions. I'll shut up now. I see hands over here. Oh, here you go. I actually, uh, I was in that question that came from Chico online, I was involved somewhat in that same process. And besides the attitudinal question that that alluded to and that Melanie has talked about, ran into a couple of kind of structural issues. One was that the point at which public comment was asked for was too late in the game. By the point where public comment was asked for, the big critical decisions had already been made and we were told, oh, it's too late to change anything about that. That's already decided. And then the second kind of thing that is kind of an attitudinal thing is it seems like where a Caltrans highway passes through a city, both entities, the, the frontline people in both entities develop an ingrained habit of saying, well, we can't do anything about that, that's a city problem, or we can't do anything about that, that's a Caltrans problem, rather than the two of them ever sitting down and treating something as a joint problem. And just seems 
like that's something that that really needs to be worked on is that idea of okay if the if where the where the city's bikeway doesn't coincide with the Caltrans crossing, um, maybe you need to get together with the city and work on that together rather than just shrugging your shoulders and saying there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, Sergio. Sir um, well, I, you can add on to it, but um, uh, for those of you in different districts and not in the Bay Area, I would recommend knowing who your complete streets coordinator is. Um, they can help you point you to the right direction. Ask them about the ten, the shop 10 year plan and the 2024 shop, and then they'll give you the list of projects that are um, that they're working on now where you could, they can actually influence the scope of those projects. And I've been, we've been working with the bike coalitions in the Bay Area on those projects that are still a little further out but that's really the time because you're right i think by the time it gets to the environmental stage um that project has already been programmed for its very specific scope and it's a, a bit more difficult to try to address it at that point um yeah. i think i think you're you're also asking the accountability question which is a really key one and and just to give a sense of like the institutional complexity that we have created on a lot of our main streets you know caltrans owns the right of way but often we we have a maintenance agreement so that the city City technically is obligated to maintain the sidewalk so it's our infrastructure but the city is under agreement to maintain it so that those are the kinds of issues where you're being told that's not our jurisdiction by Caltrans because like well the city's responsible for maintaining the sidewalk I think with this complete streets policy you know we are again flipping that script where we're like well let's go back and look at those maintenance agreements and let's talk about like what we need to be engaging with collectively like city and Caltrans sitting down together to really understand the community needs so it's it's the it's a big headache because it is it does come down to who's responsible for paying for it and you know if we were suddenly responsible for maintaining every sidewalk on the state highway system like that would be a massive challenge as well um so the district directors don't like me you know saying we should go back and open those maintenance agreements but it is important to like acknowledge we've got to sit down together and address the community needs and it does have to be done often at the planning stage so what sergio is doing on the plans you know, that's critical. We, we do want to make sure those needs are identified early because um, the farther the project gets along, you know, the more cost to, to pull it back and try to add that stuff later. So, um, but, but we got to work with the communities early as to your point, I agree. I think Ryan, Ryan wanted to say something. You made a slight gesture and I interpreted that as you want to talk. Yeah, I guess I was, maybe this is 10, might be a possibility, but like essentially with Bur with the project I talked about in Burlingame, we had a similar issue where the there was like a blame game, quote unquote, going on in the sense of some folks thought that the state was more responsible. And then um, oftentimes um, the state can feel like if there's not local support for an alternative, that it's going to be hard to go forward with that. Um, but I would say like following the money is a good idea, like, like in the sense of understanding who will have power to change a project. If there's, if, if one entity is primarily funding it, which I guess is kind of what Jeannie was getting to, like if one entity is funding the maintenance, it's harder, but, um, if there's like a large groundswell of capital coming in to make an improvement, as oftentimes does happen with the shop, perhaps it's possible in the future to use that as leverage for um, Caltrans, which has the authority to make that change, to then leverage that to negotiate the maintenance agreement in a way that can push forward, you know, a complete street improvement, which is sometimes harder because like maintaining protected bike lanes is different and more expensive. Okay, well, I have time for one more question. I've already chosen my person. But Jeannie, we're getting questions online. What is your email? <laughs> Jeannie with one N dot <laughs> board dot waller. Or you can just say you here on a me. <laughs> Just email Tony. Actually, look up Caltrans staff directory, Jeannie Ward Waller, and you will find her email. Okay, so we had a question here. Uh, 
Um, so in the context of more short-term things, um, is there a space for Caltrans to do quick build projects or fund quick build projects? That's my first question. My second question is uh, for events, um, I don't know if you guys are aware of uh, Viva Calle in San Jose or other like open streets events. Um, one, in, one idea I've heard circling around in some of my circles is an idea of doing a Viva El Camino where we close down part of the street on El Camino and have a whole fun with that. Um, but I have been told that there's been some challenges with collaborating with Caltrans to actually make that happen um, since El Camino is also such a um, in big car route. And I'm curious if you could talk about what could happen to make that make it easier to close down Caltrans streets for uh, events like these as well. So quick builds and closing streets. I would support it. <laughs> With regard to the idea of quick builds, uh, we don't have any programs set up for that, although we do have safety yet. <laughs> um, we do have safety projects that where there are some, to, to, without getting too wonky, there are ways to expedite those that they don't have to wait in the queue with other shop projects so that they get built faster, but it's not the same as quick build per se. Um, and then um, I forgot who mentioned the HM program, the, the highway maintenance uh, program. Those are maintenance projects that get delivered within a fis one fiscal year typically and we are trying to look for opportunities to include more bike and ped improvements with those because they could be done more quickly than the three to four years it takes to do a, a pavement rehab for example um yes i don't know if someone wants to talk about that we'll <laughs> I also just wanted to quickly, sh um, the last slide of my slide deck showed um, the Niles Canyon Stroll and Roll, which is State Route 84. Um, we actually do that every couple of years in partnership with the county. And so that might serve as a model to do that across a larger jurisdiction, because I think that crosses the city of Fremont and unincorporated as well. And that's done every two years. Um, maybe not as complicated as El Camino Real would be, but at least it serves as, a, as something to look toward. Um, does someone else want to sp speak about the ATP quick build or? <laughs> okay, I'll give Lori the microphone. <laughs> so the ATP program has a, a quick build pilot program as part of the overall program. And we're doing a phase two this cycle. And last cycle, we set aside up to $7 million to fund quick build projects. Unfortunately, we did not get very many good applications and it was a very easy application. So uh, some people complain about the ATP application process being difficult. This was not at all. It was a word narrative. And um, we did not get, and we, so we ended up funding uh, close to five million, but we would have funded up to seven million. So we're trying it again. We fixed a few things. One of them is um, we're hoping to do more of a quick build delivery process, working with Caltrans because um, the normal allocation delivery process doesn't work real well for quick builds. So we're trying to fix that and being more clear on what a quick build is. So we would love to fund quick more quick builds all over and anywhere. You know, anywhere that's willing to try quick builds, I think it's, I mean, it's low cost, it's it's fast, I, I think they're great. And so, and um, I do have to acknowledge Carl because it was MTC that kind of pushed us to fund those in the ATP. So yes, if you know of any places that need quick builds, encourage them to submit an application. When the next application? They are due on June 15th. What's the next the active transportation program and you can find it find out about it through the california transportation commission's website or caltrans local assistance uh, state programs i think if you google california active transportation program you will find it you guys a non-competitive part of the atp that's amazing okay i don't mean non-competitive i mean one that you actually have a chance of getting that's hey, that's a big deal okay you guys we we overstayed i hope that you all have a wonderful lunch thank you so much this is a great conversation thank you to our panelists you guys are yes